So welcome to the Pitt Rivers Museum. You will see behind me that I'm actually in the museum, um, which is quite a strange feeling as there's not many people in this at the moment. We hope that we will welcome you back um, in the near future. We're hoping to reopen on May the 17th, but we'll see. My name's Andrew McClellan and tonight's conversation will be the eighth in our Radical Hope series, Discollecting the Pitt Rivers Museum. Um, you're welcome to use the chat function. Please do introduce yourself as you already have been doing, saying where you're from and of course, do ask questions. There is a separate chat function to do that. And we'll collect together and pose as many of the questions as we can in the Q&A at the end of the conversation. We're expecting the event to last for a little under an hour or around an hour, and then to have 20 minutes to half an hour of Q&A at the end. So do think about some questions you'd like to see answered. A bit of housekeeping before we start. This event is a place for listening and learning and for conversation. And we welcome comments in the chat. So that everyone can feel safe in taking part, we would ask you to be considerate of your fellow audience members and panelists. Please keep your comments polite. I'm sure you will. So this series of events is called Radical Hope, looking beyond the museum. But what is Radical Hope for a museum? Well, Radical Hope events that we are running aim to explore contemporary changes in museums and to reimagine museum practice. They focus on how Western museums have relied on colonial ideas that have hidden or erased the many stories and ways of knowing in favour of promoting one viewpoint. The reimagined museum should be a place that supports all people to share their ways of knowing and tell their stories. This series is led by researchers and global community partners from around the world to unpick colonial practices. These events are funded by TORCH, the Oxford Research Centre in the Humanities, and the, it, the, tonight's event will be recorded and shared online after the event. Please keep your eyes open. There will be a survey coming and we'd love to have your feedback. Please ask us some questions and hopefully you will answer some of ours. So as I said this evening, we're joined by Uncomfortable Oxford. Uncomfortable Oxford is an academic-led social enterprise in the city of Oxford, which runs events highlighting stories of inequality, imperialism, race, class and gender discrimination, as well as the, the debates surrounding historical memory. The organisation's goal is to raise awareness and generate uncomfortable yet meaningful discussions about these issues in the public sphere, using in particular the built environment to bring up contested histories and their present legacies. This evening, Uncomfortable Oxford will be joined by Errol Francis. Errol is the Director of Culture and, an organisation that promotes a more equitable route into museum work. Errol is also an artist, exploring issues around perception, representation and colonial legacy. This evening's event is a live discussion, so with no further ado, let's pass over to Uncomfortable Oxford and get started. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. We're going to be taking turns speaking uh, the team from Uncomfortable Oxford. We have four different speakers from our team who will be speaking tonight. My name is Paula Larson. I'm the, one of the co-directors of Uncomfortable Oxford. Um, and I'm going to start off with a bit of an introduction. Andy, thank you so much for the description of what we do. But we also very specifically do a lot of uncomfortable tours in the city of Oxford. And one of the things that we have started to do since the pandemic is digital tours. So tonight, you're all going to be actually taking on a digital tour of the Pitt Rivers Museum. So this is a unique kind of tour, not just that it's digital, but our uncomfortable tours very specifically focus on discussion. So we're gonna ask a lot of questions throughout the tour to you, the audience, and we'd like to hear your answers. So please type all your answers to the questions into the chat box as we go through the tour today. As Andy said, please be respectful in your comments and also be open to diversity and opinions. And just a note on language before we get started. Um, at times, we will be quoting words from the past. These words will be very, can be offensive in today's context, but we're, please be aware that we are using these words just to highlight the attitudes of people from the past. And we only use them in the context of when they were first used as well. Um, one last thing is a, a trigger warning because we will be talking about subjects of colonial violence tonight. So if this is something that makes you uncomfortable, we'll warn you before those topics are, are mentioned. Um, and please take this space if, it, if you need it. In the chat, I'm going to drop a link. So you should all receive that link and it will take you to our virtual tour platform. So just go to the chat and click on this link that was just dropped in and you should all be taken in. I'll post it a number of times that it stays towards the bottom, but hopefully everybody should be able to join on our tour platform. <clears throat> 
And I'm also going to share my screen as well. So if anybody's unable to chat to see it, you'll still see it as we go. So if you can't see it yet, just check on the link. Oh, one second. You're right. I have I've been giving the link to somebody else. Thank you, everybody. There you go. Wonderful. Looks like everybody's getting it. Um, and as that goes, as you connect, I'm going to share my screen. So anyone who's unable to connect, don't worry, you'll still be able to walk through with us digitally. You can watch the screen as we go. All right, well, you should now be all in front of, well, actually I've dropped you in the beginning of the Natural History Museum is where you started out. So we will be joining, we will be going to the Pitt Rivers, but we're going to start off here in the Natural History Museum, just to, to walk ourselves in. You can see we've actually embedded throughout the website or throughout the tour platform, some of these images and icons, which you can click on yourself if you're walking on your own, but I'll click on a few of them. They just give you a bit of information about the items we're looking at and the places we are, so you can get a little bit more context. And it also is more fun to have some things to interact with throughout the tour platform. So this is our own little image of the Oxford Dodo. And we will be, um, let me just actually optimize this, perfect. And we will, here we go, be walking backwards. So how you use this platform is very easy. You can drag and dr click and move around. So you can turn around as you're clicking, holding your mouse. You can click on the different icons you see. And you can see that there's pink arrows. And the pink arrows will take you to the next scene. So we'll jump forward with the arrows together. So you can find yourself at the intro with me, and then we'll, um, we'll go through this together. Before we walk into the Pit Rivers, though, I just want to start off with a little bit about the Natural History Museum, because it was founded in 1860 through the efforts of uh, the Professor Anatomy, Henry Ackland at the time. But this museum is a good way to start thinking about how science departments began at the University of Oxford. Its first occupants in this building were actually departments of science, such as astronomy, geography, or geometry, experimental philosophy, mineralogy, geology, anatomy, et cetera. Um, and these department names are actually still seen a number above a number of the doorways if you walk through some of these accolades. So if you do ever get a chance to go into this museum in the next near future, you can go and check that out. But it really starts us off with the idea that scientific disciplines have become a standard part of our academic curriculum. And one of the major focuses of science was always creating typologies and creating categories of classification for the natural world, but of course, for the human world as time went on. This translated into the beginnings of anthropology as a subject. And the Pitt Rivers Museum is the Anthropology Museum of Oxford. Now, Oxford was behind the rest of Europe in establishing a post specifically for anthropology. So France and Denmark had posts for anthropology much earlier. And it wasn't until the external donation of 22,000 artifacts by a man named General Augustus Lane Fox Pitt Rivers that a post was created here at Oxford. Pitt Rivers was a British military officer. He fought in the Crimean War. And when he served abroad in the military, he really declared this fascination with the many cultures that he encountered. And he began to start to collect different types of weapons specifically from the places where he was stationed. In an attempt, he said on how to compare how weapons changed through time with societal progress. And those are the terms he was using. So his collections became quite famous in his day and he agreed to donate them to the university on two conditions. The first, that a museum be built and named after him, which is the Pitt Rivers Museum today. And secondly, that the items remain in, a, in an arrangement by type or typology. So that means that all items of a certain type were kept together. For instance, all weapons were kept together, um, all instruments for making fire, all boats, all, um, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Anything that was, you know, somehow a religious icon or believed to be a religious icon. And these labels were created by him, not by the communities he gathered them from. So this was meant to show one very important thing. And what he said was that it showed how civilizations underwent a process of development from stages of savagery, and again, quoting here, to civilization. And he was saying that if you looked at typologies, you could see this progress through time. And that is the context for the development of this museum. So we'll talk you through that context. We'll be questioning that context the entire time here. We really welcome your, your answers. And um, I'm just gonna see why, there we go. 
We really welcome your answers and we will be um, asking for some questions about this as we go along. So just some housekeeping rules for the virtual tour. The tour itself should last about one hour. If you're disconnected from the Zoom tour or from the link, um, you can use the same link to jump back in. So that's that should be pretty easy. Just recollect it. Again, I'll continue to repost it or other people in the in an Uncovered Boxer will continue to repost it to the chat periodically throughout this event. Um, if you get dropped from the Zoom call, you can, re you can rejoin just the same way with the same link you had. If you would like to communicate an answer, please uh, type that in the chat box and then yeah, enjoy the virtual landscape. We'll leave this net landscape live for every, per every person here. So if you save this link, you can come back to it after the event and continue to click around as you like. So it'll be a fun thing to do maybe afterwards if you'd like to continue doing that. So let's go forward into the Pitt Rivers Museum. Walk in through the doors and you'll see exactly where Andy is sitting right now. And I'm gonna turn it over to Olivia who will take this stop. Thank you, Paula. So we're now, um, all of us are together inside the Petroverse Museum, so we finally entered the museum. And in this first stop, I really want to talk about the ideas of how museums create categories of power, but also how they highlight kind of Western narratives of collection. So right now we are at the center of the ground floor of the museum. And the, the history of the of ethnographic collections is very much shaped by the colonial categories in which the objects were collected. So the words that are used do not represent the communities, but they rather represent the views of the collector. And in the Petrovers, the museum and its staff are, as, are seen to be the authorities on their collections and displays. And often that involves processes of both inclusion and exclusion of voices. So just a small warning again about the language because some of the language in the label is, is extremely offensive. So we're going to take a look at the little, so there's a little magnifying glass on one of the cases. So if you click on it, you can see a few examples of labels and lexical categories that were used in the collections. You can also find this on the Petrovers Museum website. So a small question to you, and please feel free to use the, the chat box to answer. How does this language marginalize community and cultures? What's the effect of using this language? You cannot see beyond the first picture. So there's only one picture in this case. Um, so Yvonne says that it reinforces difference. It creates hurt and harm. Yes, it's, ooh, it's moving very fast. Dehumanization, infantilization, hierarchy, it's outdated. It's othering visitors uh, to the museum. Uh, it's demeaning, creates another. So all very, very good and precise remarks. I'm sorry, I cannot keep reading all of them as they go, they go past me, but it very much creates a kind of an us and them, and it very much like creates categories in humanity that are extremely dehumanizing. And that's very much what some of those labels are doing. And many of those categories um, created by, by the labels are inherently subjective, but they're also very much power laden. That's what we've all noticed together now. They reflect the uneven power dynamics of the time. And there is, I do want to highlight here the excellent work done by Marinka Thompson-Odlem, who's a research associate at the Petrovers Museum, and who's been working on the labels in the museum to change them, but also to highlight the one that exists and that are extremely problematic. So in this kind of first section, I wanted to highlight two main processes of exclusion. So the first one is the use of colonial era name. So if you click on the little, there's a little information point that, are, that is on your left, you will see the example of uh, a label uh, that uses the word hot and tot. And this is a label that is still in the museum. I took the picture just on Monday. So it is very much still in use in the cases. And Hottentot is a term that's historically used to refer to the non-Bantu indigenous uh, nomad populations of Southern Africa, and also the wider non-Bantu uh, indigenous population who are known collectively as the Hoysan. And this word, 
Hottentot implies connotations of savagery and primitivism. So of course, the use of this ter term is extremely offensive. It was already offensive historically and is even more offensive today. And there is current pressure to criminalize it as hate speech. However, it is still present on many labels to this day. The second example I wanted to highlight, so if you close this image and you click on the little eraser symbol, so what I wanted to highlight is the idea of the correction and amendment of these names and labels without explanation. So basically using a little bit of tipex uh, to cover the label, rewrite on it, or just erase them. And one of the big problems with that is that we don't really understand the historical process underpinning the change. And we only understand that whenever there is a tour guide explaining that to us. And we don't really understand why there is this tipex. It just looks like a kind of an afterthought or a correction. And as we move forward in the tour, I want you to kind of keep in mind the um, question of what is lost in the process of simply erasing the names or modifying the labels. So to continue on this idea of like creating categories of power, we're going to move up one floor. We're going to take the little ladder. So you can either click on the ladder or on the arrow. And we're going to jump onto the first floor. And as much as labels support and sustain categories of powers, cases do very much the same. And in particular, the name of the collections. So often when collections are not divided by geographical areas or by type, they are named after the collectors. So you have very distinct groups who are enmeshed in wider collections that all refer to the one individual who collected the items. And this is the case of the Cook Voyage collection. So you can see here the description of the case. And this collection is named after Captain James Cook, who traveled extensively around the world in the late 18th century. And uh, he is associated with early uh, European colonial infringements in Australia and New Zealand and beyond in the Pacific region. So when we look at the description of the collection, the framing of the case as the Cook collection is very much fraught with contradictions. So first, it ties into ideas of age of exploration or the age of discovery, which is typically associated with Cook and other European colonists. And this uses a European way of framing and thinking about this longer history. The periodization of the age of exploration just doesn't make sense if you're a Pacific Islander. Uh, for Pacific Islanders, their own age of exploration took place centuries earlier. Secondly, James Cook's voyages also map quite, um, they map onto enlightenment notions of progress and scientific endeavor. So Cook's ships were in themselves floating laboratories and that remains the dominant narrative about his three major journeys. So the scientists on board made measurements, they collected species and they brought back many plants, but also artifacts, uh, and they called them in their own catalog, artificial curiosities. And this Cook Voyage collection uh, case is also quite unique within the museum in that it, it is not following the typology that, uh, that is used in, in most of the floors of the Pit Rivers, but it is supposed to represent the entire Pacific area in the 18th century, so at the time of Cook's voyages. So now let's just focus for a second on one object. If you cl click on the little green icon, so you will see, um, yeah, you will see a Maori heitiki. And uh, this is a stylized and carved human figure. And the label reads that it is individually named and passed down from generation to generation. But many of us will know this type of object as uh, something that is very present as a symbol of New Zealand. And it's a very good example to understand the relational effect of collection, display, and appropriation, because in the 20th century, heitikis have been produced as plastic souvenirs and from indigenous 
uh, from objects coming from indigenous cultures, they have become emblems, emblems of settler New Zealand. If we think about this heiteki, it is actually an object that's associated with fertility. But if you look at the label in the display, we can see first a focus on materials over the utilization of the object, and then the focus on utilization rather than the values that the object have. So now taking a step back, and if you look at the entire case and the diversity of cultures, but also values and uses that it is supposed to encompass, what do you think is the effect of having these items displayed in a case named the Cook Voyage case, uh, rather than Maori or Haitian? So the defacing of the labels represents a moment in the museum's history. Very few of them are still on display, signifies ownership, possession, Western discovery, not cultural life, seizing identity. Um, yes, so the power is with Cook rather than Murray, it rips out the context, uh, appropriation, Eurocentrism, dominant white gaze, silences indigenous groups. Yes, these are the ancestors of people and not Cook. So the question of ownership is very important here. Yeah, and cast Cook as the active role and he and some of the other scientists on the ship are very much the only ones who are uh, like the few individuals who are named here. And just because there are a few speakers after me, what I really want to highlight here is how Cook's dominant legacy in general obscures the tension that European journeys created across the Pacific. So first there is the violence of settler colonialism across Cook's three voyages. There are at least 45 islanders who were killed and a dozen of his crew members who were killed as well. And Cook himself was killed uh, in Hawaii. And his name has replaced indigenous names and mode of knowing. And Cook's name has become central, not only in museums, but also in the entire Pacific. So in total, we have like one country, four administrative regions, six towns, two glaciers, five islands, and four mountains named after him. And I think there's also a crater on the moon. So in many ways, Cook's legacy remains widely contested and the focus on his name and story negates the historical existence and agency of indigenous groups prior to European colonization. From an exclusively European viewpoint and the case risks erasing the diversity of cultures, histories, and traditions that existed and still exist in the Pacific. What we see instead is a focus on materials, a focus on Cook's voyages, so the moment of collection is what frames the narrative, and then a focus on the profile of the collector with the, um, the question of the ownership of the artifacts becoming extremely blurry. So we're going to move on to the next stop, which will be given by Karina. And Paula is going to guide us through uh, the remainder of the first floor of the museum and then up onto the second floor. For anyone who needs the link, I'm gonna repost the link updated to our, our current stop into the chat. So you can just click on that and you'll be taken to the same place as all of us right now. Let me just post. There you go. So click on that if you need to be refreshed or if you're lost, you can join us here upstairs in front of the arms. Okay, on this next stop, we're going to be talking specifically about contextual destruction and how museums can shape meaning in situations of displaying difficult or violent histories and objects. And to do this, we're going to be looking specifically at the at a case study, which in this case is a Jiba, and it's housed in the armor case. And this is just another trigger warning that we will be discussing colonial violence. So looking at this object, a Jiba is a kind of quilted tunic. Uh, this one is from Sudan. 
What's really noticeable about this object in particular is the bullet hole that sits in the center of the chest, one that was likely made by a British Maxim gun at the Battle of Omdurman in 1898. And this was an extremely violent battle, part of the larger British Imperial campaign, and it was also the first time that the machine gun was used in warfare. During the battle, the modest forces wore tunics just like this and relied primarily on swords and spears. So despite being outnumbered two to one, there were only 48 British soldiers killed while there were nearly 10,000 modest casualties and over 13,000 wounded. And the brutality of the violence was really intensified both by the British unwillingness to tend to the injured and their subsequent looting of the bodies. So with this background knowledge, we can evaluate the label that accompanies the tunic, um, which you can click on. And the majority of the label is interested in the physical and general characteristics of the object, but I wanna single out the last sentence of the label, which reads, it was quite possible that this piece was taken from a dead soldier after the British route at Omdurman in 1898. And here the language choice is very significant because the writer has chosen the word route instead of battle or even massacre, which minimizes the brutality and the extent of the violence committed by the British. So we really have to ask ourselves, what does the display of an object that has such a clear sign of violence and death upon it actually accomplish? So on the one hand, it is possible to understand it as a powerful visual testament to colonial violence. It is evidence of the brutality that underpinned the British Empire. And in museums, there is a great desire to foster empathy with the belief that healing can be found in witnessing and acknowledgement and the display of difficult histories. But does the display of this tunic really accomplish this? Does the single sentence at the end of the label provide sufficient enough information or would most museum visitors have enough background knowledge of the Battle of Omdurman to engage with this object in a, in a meaningful way, especially because there is a difference between seeing violence and understanding it. So then on the other hand, the display of this tunic without the proper context can also become an extension of the violence. The act of removing a piece of clothing from a body, bringing it back to the center of the empire that killed this person and mounting it on display is also a violent colonial act. And here we can think about how looting is actually a kind of collecting and how the act of collecting can be a kind of violence. And we know that this jiba was likely taken from the body of a dead modest soldier, both because looting was very common as part of British imperialism and because we actually have written accounts and photographic evidence of the looting going on after the battle. And looting and taking trophies was a major feature of colonial warfare because they acted as, quote, symbols of conquest. So in looting, dehumanization is the point because it is a way of denying slain individuals their dignity. And the display of this object becomes increasingly difficult and fraught because the museum then becomes implicated in the system of dehumanization. And in addition, um, its display could also be potentially harmful to individuals or communities that have a direct or deep connection to what is being displayed. Because to some visitors or viewers, events might seem like distant histories, but to others, they can be open wounds and be extremely traumatic things to see on display. And I think that University of Toronto professor Roger Simon speaks very eloquently to how precarious situations like this can be as he describes how there are dangers inherent in public exhibitions of violence and suffering. These dangers range from the reactivation of past conflicts and lingering animosities to a re-traumatization that leaves viewers feeling helpless in the face of overwhelming suffering to the commodification of pain within a framing that offers a voyeuristic spectacle of suffering. So what I wanna make most evident in this stop and in thinking about the jiba is to question the decisions that led up to what we are seeing and to stay conscious both of their intended and potentially unintended consequences. Asking questions like, how did this object come to be in the museum? Who wrote the label? 
How does the language promote or hide certain views of history or perpetuate colonial ideas or stereotypes? And should an, even, should an object like this even be on display? Is it potentially harmful, undignified, or dehumanizing? And another example of the ways that museums can distract from more violent or disturbing histories is visible in the case right across from the Jiba. So if you turn 180 degrees, you can see the guns case. And a substantial number of the labels very specifically discuss the evolution of the technology of the firearm. And this is a way of presenting these objects that sanitizes their intended purpose as killing machines. And this is especially no notable because of the critical role that the firearm played in colonization, and especially because General Pitt Rivers himself helped develop a firearm that played a key role in a number of colonial campaigns and brutal conflicts. So the question I wanna ask, and please feel free to answer is, how do museums display of the guns as tools potentially influence how we as an audience are interpreting them? It distracts from the blame of the people shooting. Yes, very much so. They are compared almost like art pieces. Yes, absolutely focus on aesthetics. Um, removes the agency from them, distracts from colonial conquest, normalizes violence and detaches us from it. There's no context. Yes, definitely. And the debate surrounding the display of violence and atrocities in museums is ongoing and there isn't uniform agreement on what the right thing to do is, but it is really important to engage with this subject critically and to remain aware, especially of how the legacy of colonialism might affect our perspective in this debate. So it's crucial that we as museum visitors stay critical of what we see and that we challenge and hold museums and heritage institutions accountable for what they display and how they frame it. And we now will be moving on to the next stop and Wakas will be discussing the museum more broadly. Hello Instead everyone. Move down, you just have to click the pink arrow and you'll be dropped down to the main floor again. Beautiful hole which drops you all the way downstairs. Uh, thank you, Karina. Thank you, Olivia. My name is Wakas. I'm also a co-director of Uncomfortable Oxford. And I'm going to try and pull these strings together. Um, uh, Karina, Olivia and Paula looked very uh, in a very detailed uh, way at the museum objects and the museum labels. And I want to try and take a step back and see if these readings, these interpretations, these analyses can also be applied to the space of the museum more generally. Because it is a, a very interesting and very unique museum. It does welcome hundreds and thousands of people every year. And I saw in the comments earlier on in the chat box, someone mentioning their experience hearing uh, visitors of families coming in. Many of these hundreds and thousands of people can be uh, locals, tourists, school children, university students, and, and many, many more. And this all begs the question, why do people come here? So in the before pandemic times, when we'd give tours in the uh, Pitt Rivers Museum or in the Ashmolean Museum, we'd ask this question, what is the purpose of a museum? And some of the answers that we'd get was to collect objects and materials of culture, religious and historical importance. It's also to preserve them and to research them. And of course, to present them to the public for the purpose of education and enjoyment. But it's important, it's important to wonder what was the role of museums at the time? Museums at the time were very well, very much embedded in the imperial project of expansion. They were firmly rooted in this need to learn about and quote unquote, discover new things in the world. And they had an educational function as well. Oxford, for instance, was a center for teaching and learning. And so it had a key role in disseminating knowledge gathered during these colonial ventures. But what's in, what it's important to underline as well is that as we showed during the different stops on this tour, these were constructed narratives and they had a further impact. Many men from Oxford would go on to have real power abroad and contribute to the solidification of the imperial project. So the roles of the museum both benefited from 
and contributed to colonialism and imperialism. Now, coming back to the Pitt Rivers Museum itself, initially, the collection was kept in Pitt Rivers House in London. And as Paula mentioned at the beginning, it was only after inheriting his wealthy uncle's estate that Pitt Rivers donated 22,000 objects, and those were transferred to the university in 1885. The museum itself was open to the public two years later in 1887. Now, if you click on the hourglass icon, you'll see a image of the uh, museum taken in 1915. And what's interesting in this image is to see that originally the building was naturally lit, lots of light in this image. It was naturally lit with a partially glazed roof. The roof was then boarded over in the mid 1970s and Venetian lines were installed a few years later before being replaced with a slate roof in 1998-2000. And so the question I wanna ask here in the, uh, the chat box is, what is the effect of the removal of natural light? What is it, the effect of this removal on the museum space? So Makas, two people have their hands up in the chat box if you just wanna maybe check what those questions are. Of course. So we have two people with hands up in the chat box. I see uh, Judith and Yasmin. Would they like to unmute themselves and ask their questions? Otherwise, I'm seeing lots of responses in the chat box saying that it appears more static and self-contained. The exhibits look more clinical. It feels more like an underground storage. The lighting makes it more theatrical, timeless, theatrical. Wackers, I've just given both of those people to have their hands up um, permission to talk. So they should be able to talk now if they want to. So if the two people with their hands up would like to say something, please feel free to, you're now been enabled, your mics have been enabled. Otherwise, I'll keep reading from the chat box. Lots of, lots of responses here. Spooky, I'm reading. Definitely, there's, there, there's something, there's an effect which, which, which is brought about by the removing of the lighting. And even though lighting may have changed, there is one thing which has very much remained the same. And that's the, the fact that the museum space has always been crammed with display cases. During the first five decades, new wall cases and exhibition cases were constantly added. You can see, notice on the sides, on the walls on the sides, how further uh, filled up the space becomes with these different wall cases. And this overflowing collection was such a problem that they even planned on relocating the entire museum in the 1930s. And many of the objects had to be sent to four different off-site storage spaces. Um, and even today, many are still stored away. So the striking visual effect of density has still remained. And everywhere you look, you see this sense of piling up of, of objects, of cases, and even of floors. If you look up from this main court, you'll see the galleries, which are stacked up towards this sharply pitched ceiling. And so I'd like to ask here again to the chat, um, what do you learn from this dense and stacked atmosphere created in the museum? And I believe our two people have unmuted themselves, so feel free to talk. Lots of comments I see in the chat box about the effect of mass, a sense of greed also I see in the chat box, curiosity, uh, lack of differentiation between cultures. Um, other comments I see also regarding the removal of light. Great, keep those all coming in the chat box. This is excellent. Um, someone saying that you feel hurt as well, seeing things literally on the floor, feeling grief. I, I want to focus for a few uh, minutes on these cases, because we're going to be talking a lot about cases now, not only with this tour, but also with our, our guests later on. Uh, 
uh, Errol Francis. These bespoke cases are made of uh, timber and bronze, and they are very similar to late uh, Victorian cases in the Victorian Albert Museum and the British Museum. And they're also arranged, as you can see, in this labyrinth uh, sort of layout, which con contributes to the haunting and disorienting atmosphere in the museum. Everywhere you look, you are faced with an artifact. If we zoom in to the different totem poles as well at the back, or the hanging sailing boats, or the suspended paddles and stave. And so the question I'm wondering that um, it might be interesting to ask yourself is, how do these displays affect the relationship between the viewer and the object? And Karina and Olivia have already talked about uh, this a lot. The museum becomes a, a space of containment. It becomes a space of objectification, a space of spectacle. I've seen the word theater in the comments a lot, a space of fetishization. And so the artifact, the material culture here is used as a tool, or we might even say as a weapon to emphasize the creation of difference. Difference, a word that I've also read a lot in the chat box. Uh, so by transforming life and substance in this way, it dehumanizes people. Another word that Karina used as well. And in the process, it openly glorifies the racist and bloody project of British colonialism. Let's not forget that the Pitt Rivers Museum has been described as one of the most violent places in Oxford. And so I'd like to um, ask a question here. You're, you're welcome to uh, give your answers in the chat box, but I won't uh, read all the comments here. Um, the idea that I want to um, invite you all to consider is how do you think it might feel for visitors from colonized places to see their own history held hostage in these crammed cases? Sadness, heartbreaking, I see, distressing, alienation. Lots and lots of comments in the chat box because we'd like to really explore ways to interrogate and challenge the museum space a little bit in, in, in productive ways as well and thinking more about cases. Imagine for a second coming across an empty case in the museum. If you pivot to the left you'll, and you can click on the magnifying icon, you'll see what an artist has done. Mariana Castillo de Bal did precisely this in her exhibition Between Making and Knowing Something, which was at the Modern Art Oxford Museum. And this display playfully disrupts the concept of framing or conveying historical narratives. The case was put there lying empty in order to reflect on the history of an artifact from the Pitt Rivers Museum's collection. But the artifact itself was unavailable to visitors because it was tucked away in storage. So another question we might ask ourselves is, what sort of questions does an empty case in a museum space uh, trigger in a visitor's mind? And while we think a little bit about the effect of empty cases, we want to also try and consider what might be the effects of filling these cases up again, but maybe a little bit differently. And this is uh, where we introduce uh, our guest for the evening. We're really honored to have Errol Francis from Culture And, who will be uh, speaking about his artistic practice in the museum. Um, if you go to the next stop as well on the, the platform, you will be able to see um, the, the, the work that he's done. Errol, would you like to take over? Thank you, thank you, Wakas, um, and um, thank you also to um, Olivia, uh, uh, Karina, as well for their introductions and, and your your introduction as well, because it perfectly frames um, um, the um, situation, if you like, um, that I encountered in the museum and tried to to uh, intervene into. Um, I should say that I have this, I've had a, 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 for many years a kind of fascination with museums that um, is uh, also accompanied by 
repulsion as well and they they they're in equal measure they're, they're not one doesn't dominate the other so it's a it's a it's a, a tricky balancing act and to the extent where my phd at um the slade school of fine art was about post-colonial artistic responses um to museums and this uh particular museum um really confronted me with with many challenges now my previous work has been concerned with um intervening into museum spaces and exploring senses of unbelonging uh, identity and culture and the con the very tricky concept of heritage how do we um, decide what is heritage how is it formed and to create my objective usually is to try and create a dissonance within the museum space that brings out these issues and um, um, the objects um, that, that were just described actually were quite inspirational for my res particular response to this situation, which is that I came to the museum one day uh, for a meeting um, with Andy and um, this vitrine was empty and I was just drawn to it. I think I automatically thought by its size that um, it was big enough to get into and, and so I asked um, if I could do this, and and there began a series of quite interesting negotiations about the safety and possibility of this um, happening. I mean, there were all sorts of issues, like the um, uh, the vitrine contained uh, chemicals, uh, uh, mercury, and um, uh, naphthalene, um, so it's a toxic environment, and that in itself is quite interesting. That this uh, enclosed space is toxic and um, I d it does remind me of some words um, there's there's an essay called um, Valerie Proust Museum by the philosopher Adorno where he describes the um, museum as um, a, a sepulchre as a place for dead objects um, and um, I, I find that this um, in terms of these sort of anthropological co collections they really do raise a question about the status of the object in relation to the subject. Now, the, what you just heard about the jibba, the, uh, the, the tunic with the um, bullet hole raises such a question actually about objectifying things in uh, complete separation from the subject the, or the subjective experience. And so um, uh, uh, the other thing that I was um, fascinated by with this particular museum as well was the the weapons um, and you've just all been talking about that the p35 enfield rifle that um the founder of the museum um uh, modernized uh, to be a more efficient uh, to, is a more efficient weapon um uh, and i wanted to actually explore this contradiction between museums and violence and i should say that this this um uh, question about museums and and violence and violence really came to a head last year in particular with black lives matter but also with the publication of dan hicks's book the brutish museum now dan hicks is actually a professor at oxford and he's a curator at the pit rivers and he's just published this book which really brings out the relationship between collecting and violence in particular the uh, the benin bronzes and actually there's another object in the museum that has this sort of association is one of the um, uh, objects in the Benin collection. It's an ivory object with the fire damage on it, which I think was created by the British in the uh, punitive expedition on Benin when the whole city was razed to the ground and all of its cultural assets seized and taken back to Europe. You may have heard the announcement from Berlin yesterday that finally the, the European museums where, where, where these objects are, are residing are, are, are now going to give them back. But, but I wanted to do a display that sort of connected myself with the, with the object because I feel this sense of um, connection and as I said repulsion with with the, the things in the collection but also um, the way that they're, they're described and this gun um, this uh, rifle um, is such an object um, that I felt needed to be subjective you know it needed to put into a subjective context so the whole ensemble was designed to raise these um, um, questions about violence and collecting, but also about gender and race. And what does it mean for a black man to be holding a gun or a white woman? So this this was a part of a diptych and you're gonna see the other panel um, in a moment. Um, but also what I wanted to raise was the issue about classification. 
Um, so this is the other uh, uh, side of the, the diptych, if you like. And what does it mean if a black man's holding this gun and if a white woman is holding this gun? And um, actually I've shown this to students and, and when, when they see um, this particular panel, people start talking about Venus and um, Tisha and um, all these paintings. They don't say that. Um, sadly, they don't compare me with, with Venus when, when they see it. So, so automatically this hard idea of specularity and the gaze that the vitrine um, it reenacts every time we look into it. I wanted to make this intervention with the, the you know the gun, but also uh, gendering the, the, this potential violence, if you like, of, of, of this object. It, this actually wasn't one of the items from the collection. This, for various legal and interesting reasons, we had to get a, um, a, a replica from a theatrical prop company. So that was interesting in itself that we couldn't touch these um, objects in the collection. Um, the other things in the vitrine are, um, um, uh, the, the, these are breadfruit. Um, now these are, you, you, you've all, heard, I'm sure everybody's heard about the mutiny on the bounty, but, but what's less well known is what they were carrying on that um, voyage. And we've just been hearing about Captain Cook and, and um, it, what they were carrying was these uh, breadfruit plants actually that were native to Tahiti, but they were being brought to Jamaica, which is where my family comes from. So I have this affinity to these, um, these fruit and um, they, were, they were being taken to Jamaica to feed the slaves. Um, and um, the, the book is the Geneva Bible, which is um, su such an important part of the whole colonial project. So I was trying to combine these different objects to in a way ask a question about the practice of colonialism and the means by which it was achieved and, and to bring objects that are not normally together in a collection um, plant material. Um, so this is kind of a reference to the other collections in Oxford, like the Botanical Gardens and the book with the, the, the Bodleian Library. And, and to, um, I'm quite influenced by the um, African-American artist, uh, Fred Wilson, who rearranges things in a curatorial way within museums to raise questions about history, colonialism and, and so on. So this, this was the, um, um, the, the background to this kind of temporary performance, if you like. And um, uh, I, I would love to have actually done this when the museum was opened, uh, uh, open as a, as a live display, but that wasn't possible. But um, this, was, this was the next best thing. Um, yeah, I think that's uh, in terms of an introduction. Um, oh, I, there's just one other thing I wanted to mention. Um, and it extends from the, um, um, the, the what you were hearing about the um, the jibber and the description, these clinical descriptions that you get um, uh, of objects that are um, either obtained or, um, you know, um, have been sourced um, in quite violent situations. And it's, it's a phrase that the post-colonial scholar Gayatri Chakravorty Spivak uh, used in her essay, Can the Subaltern Speak? And it's epistemic violence. So there's another type of violence that I'm trying to refer to here, which is not the actual violence of blood and, and uh, bullets and, and guns, and, um, but it's the, the violence perpetrated by discourse itself. What actually happens if you don't describe something or you, you omit to say something, and uh, that what Spivak talks about is the othering, the absence, the alienation, the forgetting, the cancelling out that, that that actually produces. And so what this ensemble was designed to do is implicitly actually comment on the way that museum, uh, uh, are, museums are connected with violence, not just by the means by which objects are acquired, but by the language used to describe those objects. Thank you. Happy to answer any questions. All right, I think we'll, um, the digital tour will, the link will remain live. I'll post one more time to the chat box for anybody who is interested in continuing to explore the digital platform we put together. But I believe we're gonna move on to questions now. So feel free to ask yeah, please, those. Please, please. There's been so many questions in the chat. I, I, just, I, can't, I can't even read the chat quick enough. There's so many things going in, so many incredibly thoughtful, um, thoughtful um, comments going in there. <clears throat> 
there's there's a few questions that have come up and i'm sure other people will um will put some in but there was one that came up from a member of staff at the pit rivers museum who'd been involved in the redisplay of the guns and i think it's an interesting question for uncomfortable oxford and for errol to some extent as well um about um so we have the pit rivers museum has a lot of stuff in it and that to some extent that there is a there's a creative um energy about that about how you know how you how you can look at objects but it does mean there's limited space for words so if, the, if there is such limited space for words on the labels what is the answer how 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 should a museum like the pit rivers um answer that question of how stories are told and presented within the museum I'll take that question, but I don't have like a different answer. There's a reason why there is a debate and museums who museum professionals who work on it every day struggle with it. Uh, the only answer I can really give you is, is an experiment that we did ourselves. So we did that we did a workshop with the with the Ashmolean Museum when we tried to to propose different labels to come up with different labels for the it was the engineer east section of the museum and it was um, in late 2019 and it was a workshop that was bringing together archaeologists anthropologists historians um, um, and the idea was that the labels would be put next to the current labels of the um, that the Ashman was using and we would then collect feedback from the visitors of the museum about what they liked what they disliked and to kind of have a sort of um, a creative process together and gather as many options from visitors and onlookers and community members as possible. The downside of it is that I cannot actually give you the results of this uh, of this workshop is that, that we did the first part where we generated the labels, but the second half, well, the pandemic uh, did, um, did kind of throw things off. So, but this is one of the things that we've contributed to, to helping with. And maybe Errol, uh, from an artistic point of view, you also have some um, something to add on this. Yeah, it's, it's the label thing is interesting because I remember once Andy, you showing showing me uh, labels, and they they were they had gone back to, you know, the labels went back to the first uh, curator of the of the museum, so they are a kind of historical uh, trail in themselves. I mean, I I just think that museum there's too much emphasis put on museums as a means by which the the um, uh, audience can engage. Um, uh, with the objects, I mean, especially now with so many different media and possibilities, um, I think that um, um, the idea of a singular voice um, giving this definitive description um, is is really outmoded. Um, I can't forget once going to an exhibition in um, Italy where there were two sets of labels and they were both in conflict with each other. Uh, one person was writing one thing and the other person wrote something that was against it, you know. So the idea of um, uh, conflict, I think, is really interesting because the the, the, the labels give the, this sort of authoritative voice, you know, there's only one interpretation, which we know there isn't. Great, that's, that was a wonderful answer, Errol. I think you I think you hit the nail on the head there. And actually it brings me around to, it fits very nicely with the question um, from the chat that I was gonna pose next anyway, but it kind of, it kind of fits. So um, should museums be answering the questions? Is that the role of a museum or should museums be posing the questions? That's a really good good way to, to, I guess the question to ask us was for a question we should be asking you, Andy, um, as, as the individual here who represents the museum. For us, I think we, we believe that the museum is a place for asking questions and that can go in any direction. It, it's a good place to be critical and a good place to bring critical interpretations. And it's a good place to gain some information and to bring your own as well. So there shouldn't be just one authority when it comes to objects or histories within museums. The audience has just as much authority to bring their histories forward as well. So that's, a, I think, a, a two way or even a multiple way, you know, spread of, of interpretation and shouldn't be just one one person asking questions ever. Great, okay. Um, 
Yeah, a question that has come in, and I don't know whether I don't know whether this is a question for me or a question for you guys, really. But it's um, quite a lot of people are saying, does the museum hold and or display only items acquired in the context of the colonial imperial uh, period? And I think it probably it, it's come up, it's come up a lot in the chat, and the, the answer to that is no. But the majority of the collections did come into the museum at the time of British. Um, colonialism so the answer is also yes I don't know whether I don't know whether anyone from uncomfortable Oxford would I mean it's it, I, I kind of feel it's a question I'd really like to pose to some uh, some of the museum's curators at a future talk but I wonder whether uncomfortable Oxford whether you you know this museum well and there's all sorts of things in here um, British, British folk objects and all sorts do, what, where do you see that balance of colonialism against the other stuff that might be here as well and is it is it relevant I think I think the question uh, that you're asking and that's being asked poses another one, which might be even more interesting, which is, are we identifying the the origins of these objects sufficiently, and are, is it being displayed well? Because <clears throat> in my in my at my stop, I talked about the purpose of a museum, and a lot of people do um, answer very quickly that the conservation aspect of a museum is. Is, is present and the research aspect of a museum is present in their purpose. But I think museums are at a critical point where they need to ask themselves whether um, these two things need to be supporting each other in, in, in an exclusive way. Is the purpose of a museum really to conserve, as in to keep, the word to keep, the keeper of a museum and the, the curator of a museum are also interesting words. Should they not be um, instead focusing uh, their energy, their time, their knowledge, and their ex ex expertise on figuring out precisely where those objects came from, how they came about, and therefore maybe um, be putting some energy into um, precisely identifying where they should be if they shouldn't be here. Because these are three underlying questions which are being asked, you know, where are these objects from? Where are they currently? How did they arrive here? And what should be done once we are aware of this knowledge, but also when it's being displayed correctly. And right now, very few of these questions are being answered in a satisfying way, or at least in a way which is presented to every visitor when they come into the museum. I think there's also another side to this question, which has to do with repatriation and the return of objects as well, in that um, museums are always uh, lacking for space. They never have enough space to store their objects properly. And so this question of returning objects could potentially also be one about freeing up space to bring in new objects from contemporary artists and um, move past this idea of the museum freezing cultures and time and representing cultures and peoples through objects that were obtained hundreds of years ago and bring more contemporary voices and contemporary narratives and discussions into this. Oh, I think we're losing a bit of a connection with you, Karina. Yeah, um, sorry, has Karina finished? Um, I think she's. I think she's um, frozen. So I think you might. I was just frozen. Uh, okay. Yeah. I. I just wanted to say that it, I think it's a more fundamental problem about where the the objects come from. It's to do the form of the 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 Western Museum. The idea of a collection of objects with which the audience engages primarily through visual the the vis visuality or the gaze is the issue. Um, so I, I was talking to the students uh, that I work with on the visual culture course this morning about the origins of the, um, the, the word museum going back to antiquity and that it you know that the origin of, a, of the, the, the idea of a museum comes from the museon which was a library a place for philosophical exchange not necessarily as a collection for objects now and it's in the colonial period that the European model of a museum solidified into this kind of space for um, for collecting and exhibiting objects and I think that's the thing that needs to be looked at is can the museum uh, be a space for intangible heritage rather than just material objects I think that there's something base and this is again Adorno talks about this about the relationship between 
uh, commodity fetishism and, and museums. You know, that there is a similar problem with the alienation of people from industrialized, um, uh, industrialized production as with audiences with objects. So I think it's a fundamental form of the museum, the Western museum that needs to be looked at. That's, yeah, that's a, that's a very interesting comment, Errol. Um, there's, there, was a question, there was a question that came up in the chat that kind of, I think is kind of alluding to that. I'm gonna, I'm gonna read out the question. Um, how does the museum still justify exhibiting the collection in this fashion, including the labels? I can appreciate preserving the original display, but unless you rename the museum, the Museum of British Colonial History, it doesn't seem appropriate anymore for this time. There's no balance to be found if you stick to the current display, it seems. So I guess I guess the question in there is, if we, if we think that, is it, is it a moment where, the, where basically the museum should be deconstructed and put back together in a different form? Is there, and, and I think this is a question for, for all five of you, really. Is there, you know, are, is, is the Pitt Rivers beyond hope? Because we seem to be saying that it's hard to find those answers um, and that, um, you know, that there's a fetishism about um, looking at all of this, all of this material culture kind of almost shoved together. Yet we also know that that's what, what brings people to the museum. Is the museum going down the wrong path or is it, you know, by, talk, by talking about colonial history, does it, does it solve any problems or does it just create new ones? I think that's the question. Well, I, I'll take that, at least start it. I'm sure someone wants to follow up. Um, I don't think that talking about colonial history just causes problems. Talking about colonial history is the first step to addressing those problems. Um, and that's just a, a very small baby step down a line of, of many more, assumably. Um, but as Karina mentioned in her talk, or her stop on the, on the tunic we were looking at, there's ways in which museums can do it well, or there's ways in which um, talking about and addressing histories of violence can be meaningful. And there's ways in which it can be ignored. And so the first step would be to, to well, as you're already doing, identifying issues, but not just identifying issues, but collaboration and consultation about issues, well, having multiple voices in there involved in those discussions and having a, a full think through about what is the purpose of this museum? Is it an anthropology museum? Because right now I would say, and I think many people who experience it see it as a museum of, of colonialism, of a museum of colonial thought. And so if it's an anthropology museum, that's, that's a completely different step, which would be those intangible, those, those discussions, those cultures and, and living cultures and, and breathing cultures being part of that, not this, uh, in many ways, a very dead <laughs> space, which you see, which is violent and uncomfortable <laughs> as soon as you walk into it. Um, and that's what it is right now. So there's, there's something, I mean, there's, many people have opinions on this, but that is what it sits at right now. So it's uh, really starting with asking them what the purpose of this museum really is. Yeah, no, I, just, I just want. Oh, sorry. Well, okay, so after, yeah. No, I mean, you, uh, I, I just wanted to add. It's, 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 it's. You know, Oxford likes holding trophies up. Um, it likes its labels the most. Um, you know, the the, the the best university in the world. Uh, the the best department of this. The best department of that. I'm not sure it it appreciated or it appreciates or enjoys the label of one of the most violent places in Oxford when you describe the Pitt Rivers Museum. And so if we are thinking about the purpose of a museum, um, we should also think about it in the context of a public space. And, and right now as a public space, um, it is not inclusive. Um, uh, right now, every day when the Pitt Rivers Museum opens it do its doors, and at least when it used to, and, and hopefully one day again, it will, when it opens it do its doors, it is um, a place where colonial atrocities are glorified. They are, they are presented as these trophies of a moment which uh, can only point towards violence. And therefore, um, it's, it's, a, it's a little bit of a pity uh, to walk into this um, uh, space and um, to manage and, and, and work in this space and not use the opportunity that it's giving us to face up to the violence of, of, of Britain's colonial past. Um, and rather than conserving, using it as a step towards reconciliation, you're using it as a step towards um, 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 actually collaborating, as Paula said, um, with people 
um, instead of preserving it. So it, in, in my opinion, it's a whole shift of the philosophy of the museum, the philosophy of the public space, the philosophy of the institution, uh, which, which, which has currently an opportunity to completely uh, not only revamp itself, but also rethink itself. Now I'll just add a small thing on it. One of the one of the things I really noticed when I come, first came to the Petrovers Museum, and I think that's what most people notice when they first come there, is just like it does give a. It looks a little bit like post, a postcard. You come in there and you feel like you're stepping into an old postcard uh, from the Victorian age, but also it reminds me of postcards of the colonial era when you would depict the populations of a lot of different countries, usually countries that were colonized by European powers, be it Britain, France, or any other. And you would see in those postcards, the kind of the fixed image, the objectified image of the populations in the different colonies. And my feeling is in that in some way, the cases and the presentation of the objects do exactly the same thing. It very much kind of fix the image of um, of populations that are not uh, from Britain, even though I do know there are objects uh, that are British, uh, that are English, Scottish, Welsh, uh, that are also uh, displayed in the cases. And there is kind of a mimic of this, of this kind of moment of photography of kind of objectifying the populations that is uh, reenacted within the museum cases. And as uh, Wakas and Paula very justly said, this could actually very, very, I mean, the, the fact that the museum is presented like this could be a very good opportunity to really address colonial history. We tend to forget about colonial history. It feels, once you're interested in it, it feels like every day there's, a, there's an article about it and there's a big debate about it. But I feel it's just because I'm reading a lot on this topic and it's very, we could very easily just avoid thinking about the legacies of colonialism and how they shape our lives and the lives of uh, billions of people today. And having the museum as it is and presenting its collection in this kind of semi intemporal way, this kind of fixated postcard way could be a very good opportunity to really be a learning space to learn about the violence and the effects and the ongoing legacies of the colonial past. Yeah, yeah I agree with that, Olivia, a lot. Um, I, I just wanted to flag up a difficulty actually that we have, uh, which is quite significant, I think. Which is, uh, I, there was a kind of moment, um, um, I think when I was doing that project actually, when I suddenly had this sort of realization that, that museums don't just, don't just uh, conserve or preserve, um, uh, preserve the objects in the collection, but the way they work, um, I, th th I sort of came to this point that actually the methodology is, is, is um, something that is conserved just as much as the objects. And that's partly what we're up against, which is, very substantial and part of that obstacle um, involves the government. Um, so we've got this situation at the moment where we've got a Secretary of State who is um, explicitly threatening museums who try to address their colonial past and this is a huge obstacle actually uh, and um, I'm not sure how we deal with it because it's the legislator you know these are the people in charge of our our country but there really is such a um a push against uh uh museums especially the national ones you know funded by dcms to make any type of change um so i you know i just put that out there that's that's what we're dealing with um, at least for the next four years Thanks, guys. That's some very thoughtful answers. I should just say at this point, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of questions coming up that I'm not going to pose to the panel. And I, I just want to let people know that I'm, I'm not trying to avoid any questions, but there are a lot of questions out there that are really aimed at um, people who work in the museum. And there have already been um, events like this with uh, museum staff, and there will be in the future. And people are asking about things like repatriation, returns, and all sorts of different things. And if you go onto the website where all these recordings are being housed at the moment, which is Pitt Rivers Museum Radical Hope, you'll find recordings of um, past events. The very first um, event that we had looked at the removal of human remains from the museum, but also quite a lot of questions about uh, returns and whether objects should be returned and how they should. And there's an, and there's also all sorts of questions about how the museum does or doesn't work with originating communities. And I think again, that's discussed in lots of different places, but probably and really really important question, but perhaps not one for today. I do have a question though for you guys. Um, 
which is about um, if the museum becomes subjective or ob objective. If the museum becomes subject, if the museum is subjective, how would it be different from an art gallery? Um, how can you ensure visitors will understand crucial context? So I think the question there is, um, yeah, if um, if we're saying that, the, that we're subjective in how we approach the museum, is is a museum like the Pyramids any different from an art gallery? And does that matter? Yeah, I think it does. Um, I don't know if, uh, there's, there's a brilliant essay called Who is Heritage? Who is Heritage by Stuart Hall. It was written in 1999. And one of the things he says about museums is the way that they fail to um, engage with the contemporary present, that this kind of um, uh, urge to preserve the past means that they can't be made present. I actually think it's a good thing if they could be uh, more like contemporary art, where they were open to that kind of interpretation of, um, of, 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 of the, you know, the, the, the work, if you like. I think that that would be a good thing, actually. And, and one of the things I'm really grateful to um, uh, Andy and his team is that it allowed me as an artist to do that, to bring this um, activity into the space, which um, addresses subjectivity and doesn't fall easily into a kind of one liner on a label. You know, I think that is what we need is to open up um, the, the responses to, to um, objects and her heritage and history without this authoritative voice coming in all the time telling us what to think. Would anyone like to add to Errol's answer there, or uh, shall we uh, shall we uh, move on? Okay, um, yeah, I mean, sorry, I, I will add to that. I just problem. ultimately, what is the difference between a museum and an art gallery? It's it's all subjective, and and we just classify them as different things. But but we're still feeling those interpretations through a subjective lens, and we're still creating those exhibits, etc., through a subjective lens. And we've asked many questions today about who created the label and who sees the label, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, but that's the same at any gallery, any space where you go in to visually engage with anything. And as Zara was talking about specifically, it's this system we've created of going in to see materials that is founded within a historical context of, of the British Empire and colonialism specifically. Um, and so if we change how we, how, I don't think that saying that the Pitt Rivers becomes an art gallery would in any way devalue it in some form, or it would just, it would just try to label it in a new way, but ultimately the things that you use to to demonstrate, um, I guess, what it's trying to do, which is to be an anthropology museum, can be done through the way it is. Well, no, I can't be done. Take that back. I sorry. That was. I just want to say that it doesn't doesn't really make a difference what what label you put upon it. The experience itself is very subjective. Yeah, I think I'll add. I mean, you, we can also just wonder what the difference is between a subjective space and a in an objective space, if that is even possible. Um, precisely a museum will be constructing the information that it presents in the form of a narrative. And a narrative is unavoidably subjective. So the question becomes, which narrative does the museum decide to focus on when it presents its objects and when it presents its cases? And therefore, which narratives is it deciding to push forward? And what's really interesting in the approaches that it can take there is what Errol suggested earlier on with confrontation between different voices, rather than having one label with no author or no um, um, information about where this label is coming from. If we had multiple voices, multiple pieces of information, multiple sources of narratives, then suddenly it becomes much more interesting because then an object becomes not only um, assimilated or understood from one perspective, but from multiple perspectives, which then also reflects the event or the origin or the culture which, uh, from which the object originates, which is also always a matter of perspective. So, I mean, I'm not the historian on the panel here, but I think I can say with, 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 with a lot of safety that history is not meant to be objective either. It's always a construct uh, along with other social uh, sciences and, 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 and art, art forms as well. I, and I'll jump in as well, <laughs> because you, you give me a lot of ideas, actually. Uh, and that's true, the, the objectivity of history is always up for debate. And just to give an example from the tour, we looked at the, the Cook Voyage collection. This is definitely a case that is supposed to represent 
many different cultures across the Pacific, the Pacific itself is large enough to contain all the continents on the planet. So just to give you an idea of the site, the size we're talking about, and yet it is within the Cook Voyage collection. So it is a very subjective aspect. The, the linearity, the narrative is the, the different voyages that James Cook did in this, in this very large space. And I think subjectivity is in art galleries and is in museums. It is written in the cases. And I think we, we should just maybe see what they have in common and they mostly I mean, some art galleries don't only rely on, on, on the gaze, but most art galleries and museums do rely on the gaze. So there's a very similar approach. So then where is the limit? Where can we draw the line between art galleries and museums? They still only rely on the gaze. And maybe it is when we're going to change the way we approach objects that are being exhibited and we may be used the touch, the smell, and other senses and other experiences that then maybe we can move forward. But at this point, when we're just thinking about people coming in and looking at things, I don't see that. I don't think there is a very big difference. That's yeah. That's a very interesting answer, Olivia. I think um, you know. I, th I think this just underlines why, for me, working with artists in a museum like the Pyramids is so important. We can write essays about objects and their histories. We can write them subjectively or objectively, or thinking it's subjective when it is objective or, or whatever. But um, if people don't read them, then we've wasted our words. Um, but when you put a piece of art in a museum, like Errol's art or like Matt Smith art that's behind me, which is also looking at uh, coloniality through an LGBT gaze, when, when we put artwork, we ask people to question it. We're not, we're not forcing an answer on people. Errol's work is about Errol's lived experience of who he is as a, as a you know, as a, a guy living in Britain in the 21st century. And it's it, art is about the lived experience of the artist, but questioning what's around them. And I think it's an incredibly powerful tool. And perhaps art is the least objective uh, label you can put in a museum. I'm sorry, I'm kind of hogging the, hogging the answers there. But uh, um, there's been some great questions, guys. And I think we probably need to bring it to a close there. There's so many unanswered questions. I'd just like to say again, um, but if I haven't brought up your question, it's not because we're trying to dodge the bullet. Um, it's because um, they, they might be better answered at a, at a different time. But I'd really like to thank our panelists today. The, I'll be editing the film tomorrow morning, getting out onto YouTube before the end of the day. And I will send around a link. Um, I don't know whether we're allowed to uh, put the um, chat out as well. I'll find out about that because it has been, it's been an incredible chat. So thank you so much to all our attendees who got involved in the conversation. I think when we were, when we were all talking about what this event might be, I think what you have all done this evening in the chat is exactly what we hoped would happen. So thank you very much for that. But I would like to um, thank Errol and Paula and Wakas and Olivia and Karina for a really, really engaging time. There's a slide that's going to about to come up um, that is a link to our visit our audience survey. So please do um, click on that and have a have a look at it um, and fill it in for us. Your feedback is really so important to us. So a massive thank you to our panel and of course to you, our wonderful audience. And we will stop here. And I hope you have a lovely evening.